Okay, and we're back, and we're still working with the new build over here, uh, the exciting new amp that we demoed last week. And today we're going to continue on testing it, putting it into different situations, different configurations, and, and see where that gets us. I think we're getting a little bit closer with this idea than others. So t for today, um, we got something cool. We're going to go and we're going to... Uh, we're going to do some slaving, right? So we're going to run this guy into the 100 water back there, right? Before we go into the ox box. So once again, thanks for watching. And as always, brought to you by Three Monkeys Solderless, right? Home of the world's best solderless audio cables, uh, both DC and audio, right? If you've never seen these, you basically just, you actually screw these on, right? There's no wire stripping. You just screw them on. There you go. You're done. Right, you just made a cable. So these are really cool. So check these out at threemonkeysolderless.com. And uh, we got a sale going on right now, so you can uh, take advantage of that. So anyway, here we go. So we have the uh, the secret transformered amp, right? And there's been a lot of like people asking like, what is that exactly is going on and can I do this to my amplifier? Let me see if I can move this thing out of the way here. Okay, it's blocking my view of the amp where I'm pointing. Um, little something on the screen so anyway people are asking like can I do this to my amp and I was like well um no <laughs> sorry to say uh the output transformer in this is different right it's a variation of a Marshall 100 watt transformer that is that I worked on to uh to get it where it could run safely right and I'm also going to be working on getting some some power transformers which will simulate um, the way I have the power supply set up as well. And then there's some interior some internal modifications, which are very slight, which kind of, you know, help the amplifier work a little bit better under these conditions. So anyway, it's, I'd, I'd love to be able to say, Hey, all you got to do is like get this thing and just plug it in here and you screw this on and adjust that. And there you are. It's, it's unfortunately nothing is ever that easy and neither is this. So, um, yeah, so here's where we're at right now. Let's, Let's listen to it because we haven't, you know, we need like a baseline again and, and we might go into GarageBand and, and tweak a little bit and uh, see what's going on there. So, all right, we'll turn the thing on. Phaser. All right, so we've got, you know, the sound. I haven't touched anything. Actually, this stuff has been sitting here uh, since the last video. I've had some other projects that I've had to work on. So this has been sitting here basically unmolested. So that's the sound. So now what I wanted to do today is I wanted to run it into the Marshall. And there's two ways I've been theorizing about how it could be done, right? And I think, you know, a lot of people were talking about like, well, this is what, you know, this guy said was done and this guy said this was done. And I appreciate all that. But at the same time, I don't listen to any of it in the sense that I will test anything, right? I mean, I've, I've, I think I've maybe said this in a comment or something, but I've been fortunate enough to work with some guitar players that were responsible for a lot of the sounds that people chase, right? And they don't really remember what they were doing, right? And a lot of times when they go into a studio and they're, and they're setting things up, you have techs that are setting things up, so they're not necessarily hands-on, and sometimes there's a lot going on 
in the control room, which is sort of out of the purview of the guitar player. So, you know, I think that there's some truth in everything. At the same time, I think everything has to be interpreted a little bit. So the theories of how, you know, all this stuff was set up, I'm just going to go with permutations that these are possibilities that could have been done. And I'm going to test them and see what they sound like. So in any case, I theorize that he was always moving towards the same kind of rig, which is the rig that he ended up with, right? In the, at, throughout his career, right? Which is sort of um, a master head and then effects that are both before that head and after that head and then power amps and then speakers, right? To give this kind of like a primitive wet dry kind of like deal back then you know he was sort of like i think he was like revolutionary in that idea so to put let's say today we're going to try we're going to we're going to go with that theory right so we're going to put the phase 90 in front of the amp right because it kind of sounds better when it's in front you know Um, so yeah, we're going to put that on the floor and then we're going to see um, about putting effects like time-based effects after the head, right? So up there, I've also got a flanger. So we'll test that out as well. Um, but first, let's let's go ahead and go first into the, the line in on the 100 watt Marshall, right? So it's not the front of the amp, it's a line in. So that could be one thing that was done then, right? To use the amplifier as a power amp, you would make a line in and it would take advantage of the phase inverter and the power tubes and then you would go out to your speaker cabinets, right? So let me go ahead and, and switch things out. So I'm gonna move, uh, put the guitar down. We're gonna swap out some cables, right? So this is actually uh, the cable coming out of our load box, right? Which has, which actually it's not the load so much as the uh, sort of the DI. So we're gonna plug that into the back of the Marshall, into the line in that I had installed a long time ago. Flip on the standby. So that's ready to go. We're gonna adjust our levels on the input side of the aux because we're now going into the speaker in instead of the line in. And then we're gonna turn this on. And we're gonna hope it works. I hear noise, that's a good sign. So there it is. What do you notice? I mean, right away, right? It's gotten brighter and it's gotten crunchier and it's sort of holding together, right? Okay, and the only thing that's gonna work on the front end of the amp right now is the presence control. So we could actually adjust that, right? Like if you were to think that that's maybe a little too bright, a little too much presence, we could go up there and hopefully not fall over. <laughs> and I'll hit a chord and we'll adjust the presence. Right, so it could get a little bit darker. And you'd want to put like your echoplex, I think, afterwards, right? So we'll we'll do that too in the future. We're going to kind of go step by step and just add things so we have a ability to control, right? So we're not sort of just piling on a bunch of gravy and being like, well, what of that is necessary? What of that is right? What of that is wrong? So anyway. <laughs> All right.
Okay, I think we got a good idea of sort of what's going on with that, right? So let's go into the front end of the amp and see how crazy that gets. It's going to get a lot crazier, so I'm going to head up there. All right, so I think we'll we'll try going to the uh, the low input of the normal channel, and I've got basically everything except for the middle back down all the way. Right, so we'll bring up the level gradually. So let's see what we get. I have to back down input on the aux a little bit. use the bass control. That's terrible. So let's turn that back down. Let's try going into um let's try going into the bright side into the low input on that side and let's see what we get I mean that's just nuts maybe try backing down on the uh, the di a little bit so sure about that I'm not so sure I think I actually prefer the line in I think I think the line in it keeps it keeps the sound together it adds some of the brightness it adds a little bit more oomph um, but it really feels like the amplifier gets a little too a little too chaotic into the front right so maybe there's some some changes, like if we were to use an EQ between the two, that might have a chance of uh, sort of recovering some of that. But let's go back to the to the line in, right? Now we can bring up the level a little bit again on the on the aux box. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, I think I do kind of like that a little bit better, right? <laughs> Maybe.
maybe that wasn't going to go on in the studio. I mean, that's possible. I mean, that may be getting a little too much. It's not bad, though. Let's see what happens if we cut back a little bit on the amp. I mean, if you, if you listen to the album, okay, there was definitely two kinds of gain structures going on on that, right? Like, for instance, the gain structure that we were listening to, you know, that was on the EVH overheads, right, for eruption, right? Let me just play that again real quick for you guys so you can sort of hear what it was because I've got that still queued up here on the, um, let's listen to it. Here we go. Right? So that little part right here. Bring it back again. Right? That's pretty nasty, right? I think someone, <laughs> someone, uh, someone commented that that sounded like an angry Bengal tiger that was just about to eat you. <laughs> right? Right? It's got that real like raspy kind of like ah, ah, kind of sound to it, like the Bengal tiger coming to get you. So yeah, um, so there's that sound right there, but then you've got the sound that's like on on Feel Your Love tonight, right? Which is kind of a fatter, kind of more laid back sound, right? It's not quite as nasty sounding, right? Um, Jamie's crying has a little bit less of that gain, right? So was Ed adjusting the levels on his amp? Was he doing it with the guitar? You know, what was creating the variations in that gain level from going to something that was a little bit, it was still a lot, but it wasn't quite as raspy, right? So, um, let's see, let's see if we back off on that. For that maybe kind of you know it could be at the control room too that they added a little bit more low end right that's possible but let's say somewhere around there Let's say maybe it's done on the controls. So let's bring back the presence in the treble a bit. I'll tell you, you know you got yourself a good marshal when the tone controls don't work at all. <laughs> now they work. All right, so let's pack off some of the mid. I mean, really, the Marshall, the middle control is sort of like everything. Right? All right, so um, maybe, you know, sometimes it was slaved, sometimes it wasn't. Maybe he brought in over two days. It was like, man, I don't like that sound. Maybe I'm just going to do something different. So let's, let's put it back into the non- Slave mode, right? So let's do that real quick. Thank you. 
we need to bring up some of that. Um, let's try putting a little something and we'll try, you know, keeping this short, but let's go into GarageBand and let's add this API. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the API, I think is I'm going to bring up like some 3k and some 10k and just go up like two dBs on this API 550 plugin. Turn that on. Okay, so there we have it. And this is just on the non reverb side of the equation, right? So let me move that out of the way. Okay. <laughs> it's not bad. If I turn it off, right? Turn it back on. It's that just a little bit of cut, right? Oh, someone else had commented that the sound kind of gels now. I think they had emailed me about it. That I got so many emails and I really appreciate you know, people commenting and talking about it and asking questions and things like that. Um, and I try to answer every single one of them. So if you email me, I'm going to get in touch with you. If you ask a question in the comments, I'm going to do my best, right? I can't give away everything I know all the time, but I'll try to, you know, help people as much as I can and offer what, you know, what I think is, is appropriate. So yeah, someone said that this was like, of, of all the clips I was doing, have done, you know, like over the last number of years I've been working on this, right? That this is the one that seems to have, like the sound ha is solid, right? It doesn't have a lot of like a whole lot of crapola around it, which is what I'm starting to not like about this particular slaving setup, right? I'm, I'm thinking that there's a couple of pieces still missing in that equation and we're going to add pieces and see if that happens. A lot of times a sound is the product of a signal chain as well. So we'll do that. But I, I agree, this is kind of like... Right, I think that doesn't have a whole lot of like this weird, you know, splatty kind of weird rotating just unmanageable mess of staticky harmonic -y, you know trash and um that was this, a thing about you know that sound too is that it had this very it was carved right it was like a block of granite that someone carved something out of right and polished it and made it into something it was like a statue right you could see the image it wasn't you know rough it was very much solid it was very much polished it created dimension right which is like sculpting right so i think that's where this is at right now now how you know we could capture that well you you know with the ox setting you can put the effects after this right now so let's you know what let's try that real quick i'm going to put the flanger right after the little di and then it'll go into the ox and we can listen to that for a second And I back off the uh, line in so I don't pop any eardrums here while I'm unplugging stuff back here. All right, so we want the out, right? Go into the out from here. 
we want the in coming from the out. You don't want your outs and your ins mixed up. Or you're going to have a very bad day. All right. It's plugged in. Turn it back on. Turn our levels up. Obviously, we don't hear it flanging. There it is. Right, so for the, it's up top, so I can't really jump that high and step on it. Oh. It does sound better, right? I think it sounds way better after the dirt. It always does. Like any, if you ever set up your pedal board, right? I, and this is, you know, experienced guys know this. Maybe there's some guys that don't, you know, sort of getting into this now and they haven't had, you know, a whole lot of time with everything. But, you know, if you were setting up just pedals, right, that were like distortion pedals, flangers, phasers, delays, your distortion box would always go first, right? Something like that. You would then put in things like choruses, phasers, and flangers. If you did it in reverse, you would get, you know, like, and if you were to plug this thing into the front end of this thing, it would sound like crap. <laughs> it just does. You know, I'm, you know, maybe there's another way of doing it. Some people say you should run it between the channels and use the jump feature as a, as a kind of effects loop. That's possible, right? Because then you're kind of, 50 percenting it and you get a milder flange but if you want the whole you're gonna need you know you're gonna need the full whack right you're gonna need the whole thing the full bonanza the full monty so yeah that's where i'm at right so i think for today's sort of like lesson to myself <laughs> is that um, phaser on the floor, flanger on in the loop, right? Got to still work on how the slaving is going to work, right? Like what do we need to do to sort of calm this situation down? I think it sounds pretty damn good into the, um, into the power amp in, right? And if you were playing large arenas, um, I would think that you would need, you know, volume more than anything else. Uh, this you know, this, this sort of setup, I think, would work in a studio as well, right? Like if you if you spent a little time, more time than I am, sort of dialing in the drive, right, into the power amp, I think you could dial it in a little bit better. And I think also, too, that maybe, just maybe, that there was an EQ there, right, in between the two units, right? Now, we've seen all those diagrams of, you know, what was on the floor, so to speak. Right. So you had interesting things, right? Why? Like, um, all right. So you had two boxes. Okay. I'm going to agree that those are probably maybe loop boxes, right? To loop in something or something that's out. Now you, you might want to consider that, you know, the EQs didn't have on offs, right? They were either on or they were not plugged in. So putting those in like a loop box would be a good idea if you didn't want to use them all the time. Right. Maybe you got two of them. Maybe one's used for 
just tonal variation. The other one's added, you know, for a little bit of extra oomph if you need it, right? So maybe there was some EQs in there, right? I'll give that. The phaser and the flanger were down by his feet because he would need to step on those. But I'm not convinced that the flanger, you know, was in the studio or in all cases connected before the amplifier. Maybe it was once in a while. I don't know. It could have been that, you know, they changed things here and there. Um, and then you have the two echoplexes. And why were those sitting all the way up on the side of the stage? Maybe he didn't want to trip on them. I mean, that's possible. Maybe he didn't want to kick them. Maybe he didn't want the, the, the singer <laughs> landing on them or kicking them off the stage or someone grabbing them and running away. I don't know. All those things are possible, right? But uh, I've got the echoplex, so we'll be adding that stuff. But for today's lessons, I think this is... This is getting it's getting pretty good. Cut it short. <laughs> All right, so I think that's good for today. Um let me know what you think about where we're headed. And I'm going to continue on with this. Try to do it every single week. It may be quicker than every week. I don't know. But as I can, um, I have some things lined up for us, right? So we're going to talk about the use of um, noise gates, right? Things like uh, that can add punch, right? How you use a noise gate in conjunction with compressors can lead to something sounding explosive, right? Which is a, is a part of that sound, right? Which is probably done from the studio. So we'll look into that, some good ways of doing that. We'll, we'll obviously experiment, like we we're talking about with the next guitar, that's gonna have the, uh, gonna have a maple neck, right? And it's gonna have um, something closer to a PAF. And then we're gonna, you know, it's gonna be the 78 pickup, but we're gonna pull the magnet out of that too and put in a, uh, a real 50s Gibson PAF magnet and see what that does as well. So anyway, thanks again for watching and uh, we'll see you next time.